Good morning, friends. A warm welcome to this time of worship with us, and uh, uh, sorry, a special welcome to those who are visiting with us today, and uh, a warm welcome to our preacher for both services, our minister of Reverend Scott Cameron. There's there's tea and coffee served in the church in the church hall, and please stay if you can. And our evening service is at 6 p.m. And again, all welcome. And our midweek meeting for prayer and Bible study Wednesday at 7:30 p.m. Please note a, a thank you from the Cameron family in the bulletin on the new website and all the other information as to the sheet. Thank you. Well, can I just welcome you as well? You know, in, in the scriptures, what a beautiful invitation we receive. We're told, come all who are weary and burdened. I wonder if that's you this morning. Well, what a lovely invitation. And this comes from the God, the friend of sinners. And he invites us to come if you're weary, if you're tired, if you're worn out, if you're fed up. <laughs> the Lord says, come. He's the friend of sinners. And what a beautiful promise. He does not turn any away who come to him. Isn't that lovely? He'll never turn anyone who comes to him. And so this morning I pray that the Lord would lift your heart as we sing his praises and as we pray for, for one another and as we pray to the Lord. Well, as we receive our call to worship. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, we read... Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Well, let's worship the Lord together in our <coughs> opening psalm, Psalm 99, there from the beginning of the psalm. The eternal Lord doth reign as king, let all the earth quake. He sits between the cherubims, let the earth be moved and shaped. So let's worship together.
let's unite our hearts and pray. Let's pray together. <clears throat> oh, our almighty and sovereign God, how we come before you today with hearts full of thanksgiving and praise. For we acknowledge your sovereignty and providence, knowing that you are the creator and sustainer of all things. And so, Lord, as we gather here together, we ask that your Holy Spirit would come upon us in power. <coughs> Lord, lift our hearts, lift our thoughts, and Lord, that we would know just the glories of that inner chamber. Lord, like the Song of Solomon, you invite us to come into the inner courts, into the chambers of your love where we will find mercy and grace and forgiveness. Lord, where we can experience peace with God. Where we can know just your irresistible grace and love. For Lord, your banner over us is love. And so Lord, this morning, I pray that you would touch each heart here bowed in prayer, from the youngest to the oldest. Lord, it's so lovely to see the children and we ask that you would bless them during these times together. And Lord, for each heart here, as we represent families and loved ones, oh Lord, oh how we pray for your blessing upon all whom we represent. And Lord, I just want to say thank you, Lord, for the congregation here at Valentour UF. Lord, I would ask that you would bless them, that you would encourage their hearts, and that you would again, Lord, bring times of refreshing for all of us. Lord, as we look to a new season, oh, that you would reveal yourself to us with fresh vision, with fresh excitement, Lord, as we look forward to what you will do. And so, Lord, as we bring these out prayers, Lord, we pray also for ourselves. Lord, I know that each heart here, maybe no one knows what we're going through. But, Lord, you know. And I ask that you would touch each life. Oh, that they would leave here changed, transformed, renewed with hope and a passion for Christ and a passion for the lost. Lord, that's our desire to you, that you would send us out from here with such a heart, a, a longing to see souls saved, one for Christ, and that we would see another day of your right hand, or that you would pour out your spirit afresh bringing glory to Jesus in all things. And so, Lord, these we offer our prayers in Jesus' sweet and precious name. Amen. Well, for a moment, I'm going to... Can I talk to some folks my own age? Hello! Oh, it's lovely to see you this morning. Well... Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, can I show you a wee picture? I'm going to share a wee story. Now, can you see that? Now, I, I know that that looks, ah, uh, you're all going, ah. Uh. Well, actually, it's not so, ah. Uh. The, the wee lamb there is actually very sad. And the you there is very angry. This is a wee lamb, a wee picture of a wee lamb that's been rejected by its mother. Now, down in the central belt, I don't know what they call them up here, but down in the central belt, they call them bummer lambs. Those lambs who have been born but get rejected by their mother. For some reason, either the mother might be sick or she's got so many wee ones to feed that she just rejects maybe the, the, what they call the runt of the litter, the, the, the poorest or the weakest lamb. And what the shepherd does is often the shepherd will come and he'll take that lamb who's been rejected by its mother and he'll try and introduce the wee lamb again. And often what the mum does is just 
hits off the wee lamb, chases it away. And it's at that moment, and in fact, I think we've got another picture here. Ah, you can go, ah, <laughs> that's the wee lamb having to go away. And you know this, it's at that moment, the shepherd comes. And he takes a hold of that wee lamb, and oh, he loves the lamb. And he holds it in his arm, and he often takes it into his own home. And he'll get a bottle of milk, and he'll start feeding it himself. And he'll keep it warm, and oh, he looks after it. And the wee lamb just loves the shepherd. I remember being on the island of Lewis, and there was a, a Donald who I knew well. He was a shepherd there. He had his own uh, croft, and he had his own sheep. And he said, now, Scott, watch this. And he put out the food in the trough that night. And there was this sheep away at the far end. And it was bolting towards Donald and this feed. And it bet all the other sheep. Oh, boy, it even bet all the lambs. It was running so fast. And he said, Scott, see that wee sheep there? Well, it's not uh, so wee now. That, was, that used to be a bummer lamb. That used to be one that was rejected. And you know this, every night they come running the fastest to me. That wee lamb loved the shepherd so dearly. And so, as these wee lambs, as they grow up loving their shepherd, they're then introduced to the rest of the flock again. And they thrive and they go on getting stronger. And you know that reminds me of ourselves. In fact, we've got the wee picture. Oh, there's the shepherd himself. Ah, oh. does that not remind you of ourselves? I wonder this morning if you've ever felt rejected, or you feel as if, oh, I'm, I don't feel loved. I don't feel cared for. Maybe today you feel as if you're second best. Maybe you feel in yourself that, oh, I'm not very good. I'm not good enough. I'm sure we've all felt like that at times. And we wonder, well this morning can I remind you of the good shepherd who loves his sheep and as he takes them to himself in his arms, I pray this morning from the youngest to the oldest that you will feel the embrace of the shepherd here this morning, that you'll know your heart lifted and encouraged and whether you've been rejected by others or oh, know today that the Lord invites us to come to him. And he'll never cast you out. Well, we're going to join our hearts. I know the children will be going through for a, a wee time together. But can we, in, as the children do that, we're going to sing. This is a beautiful hymn. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father.
beautiful words. Well, we're going to turn to the scriptures there in Isaiah chapter 6. And we're going to read from the beginning of the chapter. Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, For how long, O Lord? And he answered, Until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted, and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away. And the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Amen. And may the Lord bless us the reading of his inerrant and infallible word. Well, do you know, it's an absolute honour to be able to come to the throne of grace and prayer and to pray for others. I know that there'll be those today in our communities, maybe in your own families, who can't pray for themselves. They may feel that they don't have the words to pray and they may even feel that God would not even want to bother with them. And there's others maybe you know who are just hurt, they're broken. And you know, the Apostle Paul regards prayer as a powerful weapon. It can bring strongholds down. It can go into places that we can't go. And that's why I want to stir you up, to excite you to the place of prayer, and that we would know a joy in that place as we can see the Lord just go into places we can't. And so let's bring our loved ones, our communities, our nations, as we come to prayer, so let's pray together. <clears throat> oh, our Heavenly Father, like the one who came at midnight to ask for bread on behalf of his friends, we come before you now, interceding for those in need. We ask especially that you would provide for the struggling, whether physically or emotionally or mentally, or financially. Or Lord, it may even be that they have experienced the heartaches of broken relationships. And so, Lord, we pray for the hungry, O oh, comfort the weary. Lord, be a place of refuge for the exile. And as we look upon a spiritually darkened world today, Oh, we plead that you would bring peace to every troubled heart and community. Lord, for the cities that long for healing, for the nations in turmoil, for the communities burdened with fear and uncertainty. Lord, today we come knocking at the gates of heaven. 
For we, Lord, trust in your abounding mercy. And Lord, your irresistible grace. And so, Lord, we ask for the bread of peace. We ask for the bread of justice and hope. Lord, it may be today that we know those who would so appreciate to experience again the bread of love, the love of God, and the peace of Christ that goes beyond their understanding. O oh Lord, that oh, that hearts would again experience your tender and loving care. And so, Lord, as we lift up those who we know, those who we hold dear, our young ones, our parents, our families, and, Lord, as we lift up our dear friend Balantor and the seaboard villages here, Lord, we also lift up our dearest friend, Scotland. Oh, how we would desire that you would put your everlasting arms around this nation again. Lord, bring us back as we were once known as the land of the book, a land of revival, a land that experienced the power and the presence of God in such rich measure. Lord, we pray for another day. Oh, will you not revive us again? And Lord, as we have gone through these past years here, Lord, we're reminded of even a hundred years earlier where revival swept through these villages. As the faith mission would come, as you would use that channel to preach the gospel. Lord, today, I pray that you would use the channels of your own people here, that we would be channels of revival again. And so, Lord, as we lift up these communities, our families, Lord, we also lift up the nations of the world, we think today again of China, the Yemen, Sudan. We think of Ukraine once again and Russia and Gaza and the West Bank. But Lord, we also bring before you Israel. And we continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Oh, may they come to know wonderful rest in Christ the Messiah. And Lord, we pray for your church in the world. Lord, build us up, empower us, and add to us daily. Lord, as we read in the scriptures how the church would be added to daily, Lord, may that be our experience too. And may the gospel flourish and Christ receive his glory through his bride. And so, Lord, as we pray for ourselves, oh, revive us. Heal us, fill us, sanctify us. And Lord, oh, refresh our souls in your presence here this morning. And Lord, we now pray for one another, those sitting beside us and around us. Lord, we don't know what they've gone through, but Lord, we just want to pray for one another. Oh, bless each heart. May they feel the, the deep, deep love of Jesus flowing in to not just the sanctuary, but into their hearts. That they would sense and come to know the drawing power of Christ. And so, Lord, we offer you these, our prayers, once again in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing once again. This is a, a beautiful hymn. Be still for the presence of the Lord. The Holy One is here.
I'd like us to return to our reading there in Isaiah chapter 6. And I'm sure to many of you here, this is a well-known chapter. But I felt led to Isaiah's chapter here as we start a new season. And I've entitled our sermon series, New Vision for a New Season. Whenever you see the beginnings of a ministry, especially through the scriptures, you'll notice that a ministry begins with an encounter with God. You know, when we think of mission and discipleship, you know, you look at the New Testament church and you see the thousands that were added to that church and you scratch your head and you, and you do ask the question, why can't that happen to us? And we, what we can do is we can start creating strategies and planning and we can think, right, let's get a map out and let's see how we can be strategic in bringing the gospel to the seaboard villages. Let's have a, a, a great plan. Let's get, do some brainstorming and we'll start planning out how we're going to see revival, how we're going to see the gospel affect lives here in these communities. Well, I think it's a great lesson to be learned from these churches in the scriptures. Do you remember the old saints? That first church? If you were to ask them, so how did you plan your mission? How did you get the gospel to go out? And where so many hearts and lives and communities were affected. Do you know what that answer was? We cannot help but tell. They didn't have a book. They didn't have a manual. They just said we can't help it. Mission is ingrained in us. When you come to know Christ, you can't help but go. And when we have a heart that says, Lord, I'm a bit nervous about going. I'm a bit nervous about sharing my faith. I'm a bit nervous about speaking to others about Jesus. The last thing we need is the minister to come and condemn. Well, you should be having a heart that wants to go and you should this and you should that. No, I'm not going to come like that. What I would love to see in our new season and as we see God move in this place that we will see lives encountering the Lord themselves that you will receive a fresh encounter with the true and the living God because see when you know that experience with God when you come to him and know his presence and grow in his love you cannot help but want to go you're going to be meeting your neighbours and you'll be telling them, do you know this? <laughs> I was in church on Sunday and there was something very special there. Do you know, I could feel as if God was in that church. It wasn't just the minister, it wasn't just the elders, it wasn't just the regular members and attenders, but I could feel God. Do you know, that's often the testimony of revival. People will often tell you, we felt as if God was in the very atmosphere. You would walk out of your home and you could feel the presence of God. You would go to your place of prayer and you could feel the presence of God. Oh, to know days like that. And so the early church, they learned very quickly. What we need today is an encounter with the true and the living God. That's the greatest need of the hour for all of us. As we go to our homes, as we go into our bedrooms or into the place of secret prayer, oh, to know just a fresh encounter with God. Notice Isaiah. What a day. This was a, a day it was where the world was in such a state of crisis. This was a serious hour. We see terrorism, hatred, vicious crime, political power games, wealthy exploiting the poor, problems with alcohol, 
violence, people calling evil good and calling darkness light, the people who thought they were wise in their own sight, who think themselves so clever and above everyone else. Now remember, I'm describing 740 BC. Does that not sound like today? <laughs> A world in crisis. That's what Isaiah was looking upon. God had offered, he promised new life. He had given Israel a fertile land and his heart was to bless them. But God comes to them and said to them, the land that I've given you, you've turned it into wild grapes. You're buying up property there. The rich getting richer. And now look at your faith in me. Look at your religion. You're half-hearted. You're half-hearted. That's what God had to speak to the, the people of Israel and Judah. As God spoke to his people, he said, what a mess. And I know today we look at Scotland and we would say, what a mess. Spiritually, what a mess. Look at the nations of the world and we're seeing what Isaiah saw. That's why we can put our hand into the hand of Isaiah and we can say, I know what you must have experienced. <laughs> We're told that even in Israel and Judah, people would be flippant towards God. They would mock God openly. And there was Assyria. They're flexing their muscles as well, getting ready. Ah, oh, would Judah be next? That's a question that had been echoing through many of their hearts. And what makes it worse was a favourite king, Uzziah, had died. Oh, in the year that King Uzziah died, that seemed to crown it for Isaiah. You can see his heart. He loved the king. Some scholars believe that he was actually related to the king. We don't know. But oh, he loved Uzziah. And oh, he was a powerful king. And he was a good king. The Lord loved him. Oh, he brought wonderful reforms. But sadly, he didn't finish too well. But still, the Lord regarded him as a good king. And Isaiah's heart was broken. It was in the year that King Uzziah died. Oh, could anything worse happen? The world is in a mess. The church is in a mess. And now... The one whom I love has died. And oh, the heart of Isaiah would have sank. But the Lord knew what Isaiah needed. You know, when things are at its lowest, when you see throughout Scotland church declining, when you see the young folks having no interest in the gospel, when you see the church is emptying and closing, oh, don't get discouraged. Look up. Keep looking up. We have to hold on in these days to the promises of God. God said, I will build my church. Did you know that the church is on time? God's plans are actually on time. And the Bible is clear. Our Father's church is actually growing. It's on time. God is building his church. Even this day, there are countless lives being added to the church. Oh, the church is on time. God's plans, his sovereign purpose and will cannot be thwarted. But often what the need of the hour is, is that we have a fresh vision of God himself, of his character, his purposes, his will. And this is exactly what Isaiah came into. Here he is, feeling discouraged, looking on the nation. And his heart is broken for them. And what does the Lord do? 
in the year that King Uzziah died, when everything, oh, was now at its worst, the Lord lifted Isaiah into a glorious place. He took a hold of Isaiah and he said, Isaiah, I think you should come with me. <laughs> I think you better see this. I know your heart is flat. I know you're discouraged. And I know you've lost your king. And maybe you've been praying, what about the king? Is that it? Is that the end of the messianic line? Maybe there were people there in Israel and Judah who were thinking now, Uzziah had died, that's the end. There's now no king in Israel. There's no king in Judah. Where is that promised king? And Isaiah is lifted up. And he said, now look at this. The nations have been asking, oh, where's the king? Is he coming? Is that messianic king coming? Is the promised one, is he really coming? Is God really going to keep his covenant promise? Is he really going to fulfill his will and his purpose? And Isaiah, in the year that King Uzziah died, saw, he saw the Lord high and lifted up, his train filling the temple what did he see? He saw the king of glory. He saw Christ in glory who sat upon the throne. Isaiah knew the Lord. He is sovereign. Oh, we don't need to worry about our king. Here he is. Our Lord God reigns. Boy, that must have thrilled the heart of Isaiah. As he saw the King, the Eternal One, the Messiah. As he saw Christ in glory. As he saw the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Triune God, who is holy, holy, holy. Notice the angels. Oh, what a vision. What an experience. Paul actually talks of an experience where he said he was caught up into the third heaven. And he saw things that were lawful to speak, but there were also things that were unlawful. There were things that were just a blessing to him as God blessed the heart of the Apostle Paul. But then there were things that Paul was to share, which I believe we receive in many of his letters. But here Isaiah, in a similar fashion, is caught up into the glory and he sees the triune God. And his heart is at peace. As the angels, notice the angels, we're told that these seraphs, these Oh, these wonderful angels. Two wings were covering its eyes, two covering its feet, and two flying. There you see just the humility of these angels. See, when you're in the presence of God, oh, you can't be arrogant. <laughs> you can't be presumptuous in the presence of God. Like these angels, oh, they would cover their eyes. They would cover their feet in humility, and they would just fly around the throne of grace the throne of God and they would just cry holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and hallelujah and is to come and Isaiah got that glimpse as he received a, a new awareness of the character and the nature of God oh his heart is just caught up with with God the beauty, the majesty, the glory of who God really is. I love what Augustine said. He said, give me a man who is in love with God. <laughs> oh, this was Isaiah. After he received that new awareness of the nature of God, the character of God, being reminded of the promises of God, the sovereignty of God, God is on his throne. All is on time. God's church is growing. God's plans will not be thwarted. And so here's Isaiah, a man in love with God. But see, when you get a glimpse of that experience, when you've had that encounter with God, oh, when you look at yourself then, <laughs> what? look at Isaiah, as he experienced a new awareness of, of the nature of God. He now experiences a new awareness of his own character, who he really is at heart. And notice Isaiah, 
He doesn't tell everyone, do you know this? I had an encounter with God and oh, now I must be so good. <laughs> to have that experience, I must be such a, a good boy. The Lord must really love me and oh, the Lord's obviously going to use me now. What does Isaiah do? When he encounters the Lord, he says, Woe is me, for I am undone. I'm ruined. Look at my heart. It's when you've had an encounter with God, you then see the reality of your own heart and your own life. I remember there in Port 3 as a young Christian, my minister there asked me one prayer meeting night, he said, Scott, I want you to preach. I was in training. My minister was convinced I was called to the ministry and so he would encourage me to preach at the prayer meetings. And so here I was studying all that week and I remember in my daily readings reading about Ezekiel and it talks there about how Ezekiel was pulled up by the hair. And then there was the chapter came where the angel would go out into the world looking for someone who who had a burden for the nations, who wept for sin, who desired that God would come in mercy, who would weep and sigh over the nations. And and I remember reading that chapter thinking, wow, oh, I'm going to preach on that. And I'll make it a real challenge. And I, and, I, and I did, oh boy, I'll tell you, that night, that Tuesday night, I preached my heart out in that church. And I was telling everyone, is there anyone here who's weeping and sighing about the sins of the nation? Are you in mourning? Are you grieving? Or is it like Ezekiel? There was only one person the Lord could find. And that was Ezekiel himself. There was no one the angel could find as he went out with the ink, right, the, the ink horn of, of the writer. And you know, I remember being so challenged and so I thought, well, this is what they're going to get tonight. <laughs> But you know, there was a visitor in that church that night. And he came to me after the service and he said, well, he said, thank you for your word. And he said, but next time you preach on that chapter, can I recommend that you do a series and you make sure to preach from one to eight first? And I said, I'm sorry, what do you mean? And he said, well, he said, you know, before Ezekiel could weep and sigh for the sins of the nations, He said he had to, first of all, experience the glory of God. He said, you know, that's what we need most, is that we would experience the glory of God, his nature, his love, his kindness, his patience. We need to experience the very nature of God for ourselves. And then we'll weep and sigh for the sins of the nations. And, you know, I thank that man because... From that night, I saw it everywhere. Do you remember when Peter was to be sent out to feed the sheep and the lambs, to go out with the gospel? Before that, Jesus had to say to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you really love me? Have you experienced the love of Christ for yourself? Have you experienced the loveliness of Jesus upon your own heart? See, when you have, you'll go and feed the sheep, you'll feed the lambs. Like Isaiah, as he experienced the presence and the power of God, oh, he saw his own heart. Woe is me. Lord, I am poor and weak. I'm frail. Lord, I'm not good enough. My heart, Lord, in comparison to your glory, I'm nothing. The heart is desperately wicked and deceitful. Who can know it? But Lord, you know it. (laughs) You know my heart. And you know the angel comes now as the Lord sends the angel to, to Isaiah. And notice as the angel comes with the The burning coal, it must have been really hot. (laughs) That coal must have been scorching because the angel had to use tongs. And as that coal touched the lips of Isaiah, oh, Isaiah came to know the mercy, the forgiveness, the love, the joy, the peace, all that came through his lips being seared. As his lips were touched, 
as Isaiah was touched afresh. Yes, he experienced a new awareness of his own character. But in the midst of that, the Lord comes in his grace and mercy. And he tells Isaiah, your sins are forgiven. And this, of course, was to be the word for the people. Isaiah. In fact, he doesn't speak to Isaiah directly. Because you'll notice, when the Lord now comes to challenge, here's Isaiah. He's now had a new awareness of his own character. Now the Lord is going to ask a question. And he doesn't ask Isaiah. He said, who will go for me? He didn't say, Isaiah, I'm sending you. The call went out. Who will go for me? Because when you've had an encounter and a new awareness of the character and nature of God, when you've come to experience the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, I loved what Sinclair Ferguson said, the Holy Spirit, he comes to turn a house into a home. And see, when you've known your heart become a home for the Lord, when he's come and he indwells us, and when we've come to experience that forgiveness and that mercy and that grace, yes, we, we become then aware of ourselves. We don't have it, Lord. We can't go. We don't have the strength. We don't have the ability. We don't have the motivation. Lord, I, I'm too weak. I, I, I'm frightened to go and tell others. That's how we often feel, isn't it? But Isaiah felt like that. He felt ruined. But see, when you've known a touch from the Master's hand, when you've known the touch of God upon your life, when you know the Spirit of God now filling you, you'll be able to say like the disciples of old, I cannot help but go. I can't help but tell. Like Peter. Do you remember when he encountered Christ? There when the great hall came in of fish you would think if that was me i would have said wow jesus you're amazing if that was me if i was peter in these days oh i would have been so excited i would have been so caught up in the glory of it all this great miracle but what does peter say here's peter woe is me Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Isn't that amazing? Did you miss that? When Peter encountered God, when he encountered Christ, all he could say was, woe is me. I'm a sinful man. And oh, how Jesus, oh, his tender heart goes out to Peter. Oh, he loves Peter and he's going to use Peter. And Peter's the one who, who he's going to fill with the love, the love of Jesus, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, free. And so now the seraph, as he brings that message of forgiveness, mercy, and hope, Isaiah is totally transformed. Those who know their God shall do great exploits. Isaiah came to know God that day. He came to know the triune God. And oh, he's going to do some great exploits. And so now, notice, as Isaiah has been changed, as he's had a new awareness now of the nature of God, and he's, as he's come to have a new awareness of his own character, he now has a new awareness for the communities that he was going to. He has a heart for the lost now. Now, because of that experience, he has a heart to reach his family, his loved ones, his community, the cities, the nations. Oh, Isaiah, he's, he can't help but go. He can't help but tell of the good news of the gospel. And so when the Lord does call, who will go for me? Who will go into Ballantour for me? Who will go into Hilton? Who will go into Shandrick? Who will go throughout Easter Ross? Who is going to go into the Highlands and the Islands for me? Who is going to go throughout Scotland for me? 
when you've had an encounter with Christ, when you've had an encounter with God, oh, your heart will just melt. Lord, I'll go. I don't know what I can do, but I'll, I'll do what Mary at Bethany can do. She just did what she could, and I, I can do that. Oh, Lord. And Isaiah, when he received that call, he said, I'll go. I'll go. He overheard the call of God. Send me. And you know, the presence of God always, always produces soul winners. See, when people encounter the presence of God, you don't need to worry about witnessing for the gospel. And so can I encourage you in these days as we begin a season together, the harvest, do you know this? They're all right at the moment. We're told they're white. (laughs) They're in the right place. They're white unto harvest. The problem is the laborers. We need to pray for the laborers. We need to pray for one another that the Lord will empower us to go out. That's where we need the prayers. Oh, that the Lord would come and touch our lips, that he would transform our lives, and that we will go out for him to win souls. Is that your heart? Have you been going through a time of crisis? I wonder if you've been going through a time in your life where you've been just downcast. You feel depressed, you feel discouraged. And maybe you've seen your children, your grandchildren, family members who don't seem to have an interest in coming to church or even listening to the gospel. Can I encourage you? Don't worry. You know where the Lord sent Isaiah? He sent him to a place where people wouldn't listen to the gospel. Isn't that amazing? He said, you're going to go to a people who will reject the gospel. And you know, there are times that we're going to go out into our families, into our communities, and they will reject the gospel. Don't worry. Oh, today, oh, lift your heart. Lift your thoughts. Lift your prayers. And maybe today what we need is, Lord, we need to encounter you afresh. A fresh vision of who you are. Is that your desire? Is that your heart? Well, can we unite our hearts as we pray together? Let's pray. Lord, we just want to thank you for your sweet presence in this place. Lord, it is our desire that you would deepen that presence in our lives. That we would be men and women and children who love God. And who know the loveliness of Christ and the fragrance of heaven upon our lives. Lord, I know we we are to go out into this world like exiles, like strangers. And Lord, we're going to face opposition. We will face rejection. There will be hardened hearts. Those who will mock God openly. But Lord, oh, when we've experienced the love of Jesus, we can't help but tell. And so Lord, oh, would you fill each heart here. Fill us now, we pray. Oh, empower us of your spirit. And that you would give us a tender and a loving heart. And a heart that desires to win souls for Christ. And so, Lord, we offer these our prayers. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing in our hymn. This This is a beautiful hymn. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship, comfort and the power of the Holy Spirit, one God, be with you now and forevermore. Amen.